Good morning, everyone. Praise God. Wanting to do something a little different today. We're just going to uh, spend time in the presence of the Lord together. This is a different format of live streaming. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, we're doing a vertical style type of uh, live stream. We're going to begin to spend time with the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you're new, I encourage you to join us and just sit and just be still with the Holy Spirit. The highest thing that we can offer the Lord is our very lives. And in the busyness of our life, it's very good for us to take a pause, to stop, to be still, and to know that God is the Lord. Psalm chapter 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. So I want to encourage you today to lay all of your cares, cast all of your cares to the side. The scripture says, cast your burden to the Lord, for he cares for us. Jesus cares immensely for his children. The Bible says that he is a faithful high priest. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. The Bible says he was in all points uh, tempted yet without sin. He comes to you as a faithful friend. He doesn't come to condemn you and to shoo you away and to cast negativity on you. He comes with his love and he brings us to himself. If you don't know Jesus today, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Jesus is Lord and he loves you. He died on the tree. He died on the cross for you and me. He gave us his very life. He is the perfect love of God made flesh, made visible. And so I want to encourage you today. Let's spend time with him. Let's just be still. We'll have a time where we'll answer some questions, some answers. I don't claim to know all the answers, <laughs> but I know the answer, who is Jesus. So let's just spend time with him. Let's be still. Let's just be still. It might be new for some of you. Maybe you're not used to that. Maybe when you think of prayer, you think of talking or doing or saying a bunch of things. But I want to encourage you just to be with the Lord. Just be with him. Amen. So let's do that today.
rod and your staff, they comfort me.
if you can, maybe you're at home or just begin to praise the Lord. Begin to lift up your hands if you can. If you're driving, then stay driving. You are beautiful beyond description. You are too weighty for words. How we worship you. Holy, 
there's none like you. fountain of living water, Lord. He said in your word, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. This you spoke of the Holy Spirit. You are the source of true joy and satisfaction. How we worship you. How we honor your holy presence. There's none like you. None beside you. None can compare to you.
worship of our soul. such a great high priest Jesus who passed through the heavens let us lay hold of our confession for we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin therefore let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain grace in the time of need he's the shepherd of our soul He's the great apostle that was sent from heaven to earth. He's holy and pure. He's the blessed Lamb of God. He's that perfect offering. He's that paschal Lamb. Without sin, without blemish, without fault. Thank you for the precious blood. Thank you for offering your life for us. You have made us a kingdom of priests unto our God. Let our worship rise like incense unto your presence, O Lord. Revive our hearts with your love. strength. They shall mount up with wings as of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Just bless him with your praise and your love towards him. the things that are concerning you? What are the fears and the frustrations that you have? The scripture says that you can cast your care before the Lord, for He cares for you. You can come to Him at any time. 
cares for you. He can be trusted. He's a faithful shepherd. If you feel like you have fallen away from the Lord, today's the day. Just recommit your life back to Christ. Just say, Jesus, I rededicate my life back to you. Someone is saying, I'm struggling with fully commitment to him. Well, give your struggle to him. Confess it to him. The scripture says if you confess your faults, he's, he will heal you. He will heal your soul. commits her life to Jesus. Amen. Bless you. child again you gotta have childlike faith for this time of adoration. Do your work in me. Do your work in me. I want me. Mm. It comes and comes and glimpses of your face and I'm never gonna be the same. someone right now is you're preparing for your studies and you're writing things down I pray for the grace of the Holy Spirit to be on you and for his peace and his comfort and his guidance to be multiplied to you as you're st sitting and studying right now may the Holy Spirit release ten a tenderization of your heart for his glory amen Praise God. We're just sitting in his presence. Just sitting here with the Lord. No agenda. 
just being with the Lord, committing a time of adoration to him. And after we spend some time just here committing our hearts to the Lord, I want to talk to you about Jesus being our faithful high priest. And I want to talk to you about the power of the cross. But let's just sit here just a little while more. And for those who are wondering what music this is, this is from my dear friend Jackie Baker. The Lord is rich in mercy. He abounds in loving kindness. His faithfulness endures for all generations. He is full of mercy and love. After the teaching, we'll have a time of Q&A. If you're having technical difficulties on Facebook, I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel. Just look for Chris Garcia and we're streaming from the channel. If you're having some issues with Facebook.
mercy is everlasting. Your mercies are new every morning. Exalt the Lord. As far as the east is to the west, your mercies are great. Praise the Lord, for he is good. His love and mercy endure forever. How we love you, Lord. Worship you, Lord. Can you believe it's been 40 minutes already? We've just been lost in the presence of God, just worshiping Him. If you're on YouTube, there's over 825 of you watching. Like the stream. If you're on Instagram, give it a heart. If you're on Facebook, give it a like, a share. And just worship his presence. One of the best things you can do is just simply be with the Lord, not to look for his hands, but to seek his face, not trying to get something from him, but to be with him. It's good for the spirit. It's good for the soul to be refreshed when we come to the Lord. He says, come to me. Whoever has burdens, heavy laden, he says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. You'll find rest for your soul. He says, come to me, come to him. and love him 
Oh, there's no greater thing for children to be with the Father. The love of God, the grace of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. The sweet communion with the Spirit.
holy, holy, Holy Spirit, reveal to us the holiness of Christ. You are pure and holy. You are clean and pure. Oh, we worship you, Lord. There's none like you in all the earth. You are holy. Holy. It means pure, special, sacred, consecrated. It is to be set apart. The Lord is holy. He is holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah 6, Isaiah, the prophet, considered one of the most holiest men of Israel at that time. When he saw the magnificence of the glory of God in Isaiah 6, he saw the seraphim, and they were crying out to one another back and forth. They began to cry out concerning the Lord, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. And immediately when he had a revelation of that holiness, he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. When you have a revelation of the holiness of God, you have a revelation of how we fall short. God is absolute perfection. He's absolute holy in his character and in his nature. And no flesh can stand in his presence, the scripture says. No man no woman can glory in his presence. But God desires to fellowship with his children. The word fellowship, it just simply means communion. It, God wants to share space with you. We see it from the beginning. The Bible says uh, clearly that God created man in his own image and in his own likeness. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, just as there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, man is spirit, soul, and body in accordance with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Humanity was meant to fellowship, to have relationship, to relate with the Lord. And because of sin, because of the corruption of this world, the Bible says sin separates us from God. And in his holiness, no flesh can stand in his presence. But because God is love, he so yearns for a relationship that he decided, even the earth before the earth was formed, it's a mystery that we don't fully understand, but God became man. The scripture says, great is the mystery of godliness that God was made visible in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In Genesis chapter 1, we see that everything that ever existed, visible and invisible, came through the Word of God. The Bible says God spoke and it was. God spoke and it came to be. He said light and there was light. There was evening, there was morning the first day. And we see this beautiful rhythm of creation. We see six waves of creation that we see in Genesis chapter 1. And we see that in Genesis chapter 2. It's very interesting because in Genesis 1, in the Hebrew it says, Elohim created, Elohim created, Elohim created. Elohim is the plurality of majesty. It's, it's uh, who God is, many but one. There's a plurality, let us make man, let us. But in, but in Genesis chapter 2, we see the narrative of the creation takes a shift. We see that God creates with his word. And we see that in Genesis chapter 1, he is creator, Elohim. 
But then in Genesis chapter 2, we see that it is the word, the Lord God. It's the tetragrammaton. It's the sacred name of the God of Israel. It is the personal name of the Lord. And that is to say that in Genesis 2, the Lord God. And what he does is he just doesn't speak to the man. The Bible says he forms him out of the dust. He forms him out of the ground. And he breathes into the man the breath of life. It's such a beautiful reality because in all of creation, he is creator. But in relation to man, he is deeply and intricately personal. And there we see in Genesis 2, even a foreshadow of the gospel, God gets down to the earth and breathes into the man the breath of life. And in the same way, Jesus of Nazareth, God Almighty manifested in the flesh, comes into the earth, becomes a man of the earth, and breathes the life again of the Holy Spirit to a new creation. We see in Genesis uh, 2 how God breathes into the first creation and man becomes a living soul. And then we see in John's gospel a little bit later, beautiful typology of the creation in Genesis 2, where it says that Jesus, after his uh, death on the cross, he comes in, he resurrects, and the disciples were full of doubt. They did not believe. And he walks through the wall and he says, peace be unto you. And some of them were afraid. And some of them were confused and bewildered. What, what sort of thing is this? And the Bible says that he goes to the disciples, he takes them by the hand, and he breathes on them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. <sighs> See, he, it is the born-again experience, but it is a new creation. The Bible says that whoever's in Christ, he is a new creation altogether. The old has passed away, the new has come. We see all of these fabrics of the gospel communicated in Genesis from the beginning. The Bible says, I am the Lord, and I decree the end from the beginning. And so, just as God was personal and got down in the dirt and breathed into the man the breath of life, man became a living soul. It's interesting that the scripture refers to Jesus as the second Adam or the last Adam. And that is to say that there are many things that happened in the life of Adam that we see in the life of Christ. For example, the word Adam, Adama, is the Hebrew word, which means human. But it can also mean red. It can also be translated as blood. One who is reddish in appearance and isn't that like Jesus? He comes in. He is manifested as man. And what color was he on the cross? Red. He gave his blood. And just as Adam fell asleep, and out of the side of Adam came his wife, Eve, just as Christ, who was covered in blood, offered his very life, fell asleep in death. They pierced his side, and out of the side comes the church, the bride of Christ, you and I. Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom in John's gospel. And so it's a beautiful tapestry of the gospel. We see yeah, the famous account in Genesis chapter 6, the story of Noah and the flood. The Bible says in Peter that the, that the ark was a type of Christ. What, what does that mean? The ark was made out of wood. And there was a wrath that was to come because the scripture says that God was remorsed. He was, he was saddened that his creation began to turn away from him because of the effects of sin. When Adam partook 
he partook of condemnation and death. And he was exiled out of paradise, not because of anger, but because of God's love. God did not want the man to be eternally damned in the condition that he was. So the Lord banished him from the paradise of God. But the presence of God, God was still working with him. How do we know this? We see that Adam receives revelation concerning a son. Even in the killing of Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel is speaking with God. But what happens is, as sin began to progress, the effects of sin started to contaminate and corrupt everything that was. The order of things was once good and holy. But because of sin, sin came in and began to corrode all of creation. It's kind of like this. Imagine you are born in out of, an outer space and there's no spacesuit. The very system itself is corrupted. The very system it itself has death. There's no air. And in the same way, when we are all born into this world, we are born into a death. And Jesus came to deliver us and to rescue us from death. There is a literal death. One day, you and I are all going to die. One day, we will take our last breath. Where will you be in the presence of God? Will you, where will you spend eternity? Where is your heart with the Lord? We're going to answer to the Lord one day. The Bible says that there is, there is coming a day where every single man uh, will be held accountable for all of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And there's going to come a day where we will stand before the presence of God and give an account. And so we see all of these beautiful things. We see Jesus giving his very life. But why would Jesus come to the earth to die a most horrific, excruciating pain? Couldn't he just forgave us and, and that was it? See, when God comes into the scene, he gets down to the nitty gritty. Remember that in Genesis 2, that the Lord got down into the earth and formed the man. And when his man departed from his presence, the Lord did the same. He came into the world and he got down. He became a man. That's called the incarnation. What does that mean? That God incarnated onto this earth. There's a song, what if God was one of us? Yes, he was. God experienced suffering, temptation, all sorts of things. His appearing completely shifted everything. He was ushering in a new creation. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word at hand, it means at arm's length. It can be touched. And this is what God wants. God wants shared space with his creation. God wants to reconcile all of creation back to himself. He is the ark that we see in Genesis 6. So, so going back to that, the Bible says that Jesus is a type of ark. What does that mean? When the floodwaters of, of wrath came, Noah and the eight, which is a symbol of new creation, runs into the ark, the Lord, and all the different animals came into the ark. And that is be the beautiful typology of the gospel that we come from all different backgrounds, all sorts of different uh, shapes. <laughs> we can be like the animals, <laughs> if you want to look at it like that. We get into the ark, who is Christ, and preserves us and protects us. It's no coincidence that he died on a wooden cross. 
He died into the hands of the Gentiles, the Romans. It's to say that the ark is made out of the cross. It's the expression of his love. And we see that for 40 days and 40 nights, the waters began to come. And God tells him to take the dove, Noah, take a dove and throw it. And if it returns back, then we need to keep waiting. But if it doesn't return it, and it remains there, then we're about to embark into the new creation. And there we see the whole gospel again. What do we mean? Jesus, like I said, he is that typology of the ark. And he's also the one who shows us the new creation. Just as though the dove dis, uh, fell, uh, excuse me, uh, flew away and came back the first time, he does it again a second time and it remains and lands on a new creation, a new baptismal water, a new, a new moment of time. We see this in Genesis 6. It's no coincidence to say that when Jesus went to the river Jordan, and was baptized, and he came up out of the waters, he is the firstborn of the new creation, in which the Holy Spirit, the dove, likened to a dove, remains on him forever. And so too we, when we go into the waters of baptism, when we identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, when we come in and we receive him, and we go into the ark who is Christ, we come out of the waters as a new creation. Old things have passed away. The new has come and the dove remains on us. The gift of eternal life is the gift of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and on the inside of me. And so he willingly did this for you and he willingly did this for me out of the expression of love. Scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever looks, whoever believes on him would be saved, have everlasting life, everlasting life in accordance with Jesus' own words in John 17, 3, is this word right here, that they may know you, Lord, and believe in the one whom you sent, eternal life just doesn't begin when you die and go to heaven. Eternal life begins the moment you've received Christ and you know the Lord. When you know the author of life, you have eternal life. When you come to believe in the Prince of Peace, you have everlasting peace. You see, we have separated, uh, I receive Christ and then when I die, I go to heaven, that's it. No, you receive Christ and you receive him daily because he's in you and with you. And every day you get to partake of the tree of life. Who is Jesus? And so he, now the other question would be like, why would he give his blood? Why would he, why would he do that? Well, the Bible says that there is life in the blood where there is blood. There is life. The shedding of blood, the scripture says, for, there, for there, there needs to be the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because blood is the symbol in the typology of life. If there is no blood, there is no life. And what greater measure of love to demonstrate to the world that God became flesh he took on flesh, he became man, and he took upon himself the weight of the world. He took upon himself the sin of the world. And not only did he take it upon his shoulders, he stripped himself of all his dignity. He stripped himself of all of his rights and his privileges. He stripped himself of everything. He took upon absolute humiliation. They allowed him to pluck the beard off of his face. They put a bag over his head in the Gospels and they struck him. 
and made fun of him. They put a th- crown of thorns over his head. They wagged their heads. They beat him. They scourged him. And he allowed it all. It was the complete humiliation of Christ that brought victory. Jesus was both the victim and the victor. Jesus was both the sacrificial lamb and the high priest who offered the lamb. You see, beautiful uh, realities in the gospel. And we see that he was pierced, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 53 and Isaiah chapter 52, that he was a man unrecognizable, marred beyond human comprehension, that he sprinkled many nations. The word sprinkled is a priestly term. It comes from the book of Exodus when God anointed Aaron, the high priest, and the five of his sons. And they sprinkled the blood on his right earlobe, the right hand, and the right big toe. Who is at the right hand of God? Jesus, the one covered in blood, the high priest. And then they began to consecrate the people with the sprinkling of the blood. Jesus sprinkles the nations with his blood because he is that beautiful Passover lamb. It's no coincidence that Jesus culminates all of his passion on through the Passover. And if you understand the story of the Passover, you'll understand that Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the feast of the Passover. What is the Passover? When the children of Israel were were enslaved in bondage for 400 years in Egypt, the Bible says that God heard their cries. He heard their prayers. And one of the most powerful things began to happen. There was different judgments and plagues against the gods of Egypt, against the principalities of of the gods of Egypt, the Lord pronounced the judgments because Pharaoh refused to let his, let God's people go. He says, let my people go so that they may worship me. That's what he said. That's what the Lord said through the mouth of Aaron and Moses. And the judgments was this. The highest judgment was Pharaoh kept refusing. Pharaoh kept refusing. Pharaoh kept re- not. Pharaoh kept refusing. And we see that the last judgment, the last plague, was that the angel of death would pass through and smite all the firstborn of Egypt. Why? Out of out of recompense, because Egypt killed the firstborns of the Israelites. And it was a sin that was recapitulated and revisited upon them. But then God says to Moses, take a hyssop and take an unblemished lamb and dip the hyssop into the blood of the lamb and strike the lentils and the doorposts of the house with the blood. Wherever I see the blood, I will pass over. I will allow the angel of death to pass over and that plague will not come near your dwelling place. The other thing that's very interesting is in their journey from Egypt into the promised land, um, excuse me, the wilderness, God tells Moses and the Israelites to take an entire roasted lamb and eat it and consume it that it would be marked for the first day of their year. We see Christ all over that. In what way? In what way? Death no longer has dominion over us because the blood of the Lamb has been applied to the doorposts of our lives and hearts. 
Jesus became that perfect offering for death. He took on the ransom. He took on death for triumph, victory. And we see that just as the angel of death passed over and did not touch those who had the blood, those who are in Christ do not die. And it reminds me of what Jesus says. He says, though he die, he, he who comes to me will, shall never taste death. Why? Because he is that Passover lamb. And not only that, the beginning, how do we, the beginning from coming out of Egypt into the wilderness, beautiful typology of the Christian life. We come out of Egypt. We come out of Pharaoh. We come out of the world, the land of bondage. And how is it marked for the first of our lives? When we consume Christ. When we, that is to say, when we consume the Lamb of God. You see the beautiful symbolism and the prophetic imagery leading to Jesus. It is no coincidence at all, none whatsoever, that all of these little typologies speak of Christ. Now, I want to show you something else here. For 400 years, they were enslaved from Egypt and transitioned into the wilderness. For 400 years, there was silence from Malachi to Matthew. 400 years of silence. Moses brought the physical liberation and emancipation out of the out of the Israelites from Egypt in from bondage to freedom and Jesus who is a typology of a new Moses responds God responds after 400 years of spiritual bondage into the world he comes into the scene and delivers us Jesus is our deliverer there is a reason why we see that in the gospel of John 1, we see that grace and truth came through Jesus. The law was given to Mo through Moses. There's a, there's a contrast and a transition from law to grace. The first miracle that Moses performed was water into blood which is blood is a symbol of <clears throat> death. The first miracle that Jesus performed was water into wine, which is grace and joy. You see, uh, and how do we know that? Because wine is a, is a typology of joy. And Paul tells Timothy that, uh, I believe it's in Paul or Peter, he said, have a little glass of wine, for it is good for the heart to be seasoned with grace. So wine is a symbol of grace. It's beautiful. And Jesus, we see that when Moses came out of the, 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 the Mount Sinai, came out of the mountain, and he brought with him the glory of God, and the uh, the law, the what happened? The people committed idolatry, and three thousand were struck dead because of the holiness of God and the gravity of sin. Yet in the new covenant, what we see is in the upper room, the spiritual high place. The Holy Spirit descends on the disciples. And 3,000 souls get added into the kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? It's a wonderful reality, typology of the gospel. And so Jesus, as we're reflecting, as we're thinking about this week, 
traditionally referred to as Holy Week, that tomorrow we think of the day called Good Friday. What was so good about it? It was a very dark time in history, but it was very good. Why? Because it was the day that brought triumph, that brought the forgiveness of sins. It was the day that marked the beginning of it. And the resurrection culminates all that. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus is that ark. Jesus is God coming into the scene and forming a new man for himself. Even the dog says amen. <laughs> so if you hear the dogs barking, apologize. Jesus is that Passover lamb. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our, of our faith and life. And the reality is this. If we diminish... Sorry, guys. <laughs> if we diminish the power of sin, we diminish the price that is paid for sin. Give me a second. Okay. I'm going to say it again. If we diminish the effects and the power of sin, we diminish the price paid for sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin grieves God. Sin hurts God. Why? Because it mars the image of God in our life. The scripture says in Genesis 1.26, very clearly says, let us make man in our image and likeness. God does not sin. God is good and holy and pure. Human beings are sinful. We are sinful. But that wasn't the original intent. And so what happens is sin grieves God because it mars us. It de it uh it deforms the image of God in our lives. And sin is so painful to God that God became man to take on our sin. Not only does he wash us and cleanse us from the power of sin, but he also disarms devils, principalities, and powers, and decrees that are set against us. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, that Christ disarmed the principalities and powers on the cross. Jesus triumphs in the cross. The world does not understand the pain and the suffering and the agony and the anguish and they see defeat and death, but God saw it as the disarmament of satanic oppression, as the eviction notice of demonic tyranny in our lives. Jesus broke death by dying. Jesus became highly exalted by his humiliation. Jesus ripped apart the hands and feet of Satan's power by taking his own hands and feet and allowing them to be pierced. 
What a powerful reality. What a mystery that we will never fully comprehend. You see, the spiritual, the natural man, all the natural man wants to do is try to figure out and intellectualize and philosophize God. The Bible says the natural man does not perceive the things of the Spirit because they are foolishness to him. They are offensive. They are folly. The Bible says they are meaningless nonsense to him. But the spiritual man receives spiritual things. This is a mystery that we cannot fully comprehend with the intellect of our mind but it must be experienced and received by faith. Have you ever tried to pick apart a sunset or look at a flower and pick apart the petals? If you pick everything apart and try to reason and try to apply logic, you miss the beauty and the mystery of what you're seeing and what you're enjoying. Some things are not meant to be picked apart, but received and enjoyed. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. The gospel is both stunning, beautiful, and mysterious. And so maybe you're here watching today and you're listening and You've never heard the gospel broken down in this way before. I want to tell you that you can receive Christ. You can partake of that lamb by confessing your need for him. The scripture says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe that's you today. How do I do that? Just call out to him. Say, Father, come into my heart. Lord, I confess you. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I receive forgiveness of sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I want to know you. I confess my faults. I confess my sin. I receive you today. In Jesus' name. Friends, listen. The gospel can also be likened to the prodigal son where we see how there was a father who had two sons. One was righteous. One was doing all the right things. And the other one was right, just living an, ex, ex, an expensive and a luxurious lifestyle, literally wasting his inheritance. He reaches the lowest slum. He spends all of his money on, on, on holy living and, and um, he spends all of his things uh, on, on women and, and all sorts of things. And he had to reach a low place. He started eating the pods of the pigs. And he said, huh, I've reached the lowest point of my life. Maybe if I go back to my father's house, If I go back to my father's house, he'll forgive me. Make and maybe he'll make me as one of his servants. He had a, a mentality of, of a servant. Because he didn't feel worthy. He says, he says as follows. He says, He says, make me one of your hired servants. And we see in scripture that he's rehearsing in his mind 
as he's walking towards his father's house. And the Bible says that his father saw him from a way off and ran to him. Kissed him, put a ring on his finger, sobbed over him. And he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I've, I've sinned against you. Make me one of your hired servants. And he just completely disregards him. He says, kill the fatted calf for my son was dead and now he lives. Now he's alive. For, for he was lost and now he's found. He knew, the son knew that he had fallen away. The son knew that he was eating the pods of the pigs. The son felt remorse and repentance. And the father didn't shoo him in the way. The father didn't yell at him and told him to get better and come back when he's better. No, the father ran towards his son. That right there. That right there. Um, is the gospel. The father runs to you. Maybe you've been eating at the pods of the pigs. Maybe you've spent... Your living on all unrighteous living. Maybe you've lived a life where your conscience completely just eats away at you. Maybe the way you view God is distant and angry and he doesn't want anything to do with you. Friend, today if you hear his voice don't harden your heart you can run to him and as you look towards him he runs towards you and he puts a ring on your finger he puts new clothing on you he rejoices over you that's the father's love that is the power of the gospel we were once lost and now we're found we were blind and now we see. We were deaf and now we hear. We had dead hearts and now our hearts are enlivened. We had a heart of stone, now we have a heart of flesh. We were dry, but now we become fountains. Isn't that powerful? That's the power of the gospel. When we receive Jesus, we have to recognize that we need him. Amen. Praise God. If you've received the Lord Jesus for the first time, put a number one on the chat, whether you're watching on my Facebook channel or whether you're watching on Instagram or whether you're watching on YouTube so that we can say hello if you've received the Lord Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you were watching today and you recommitted your life to Jesus. Put a number two on it. Praise God. The Reels Nature One watching from Instagram just gave their life to the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. NCH Jaden, several others decided to recommit their lives to the Lord. Praise God. Catherine, Decker, Elodia, Sadiku, Jungan Lee, Rebecca, Neri. Awesome. Good to see all of you. Whitney, Angela, Karen, a lot of rededications to the Lord. Every day, I just encourage you to fellowship with God. I, every day, I encourage you to spend time in the presence of the Lord. Now listen, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, very important. I don't typically stream on Instagram. I don't typically stream on Facebook. And I'm streaming from my personal Facebook page, so I'm, I'm not... Um, I don't typically do that, but what I do typically do 
is every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. We stream. We spend time in the presence of the Lord, very similar to this. And uh, we spend about two, two and a half hours just waiting before the presence of God. The time goes by so fast. We just spend time with the Lord Jesus. And then we get into the word of God. We do some Bible studies. And it's really designed to be a devotional. If you have not had the opportunity to subscribe to the YouTube channel, that's where we do most of our ministry um, on the Father's glory end. Okay? Uh, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we do our live stream called Fresh Oil. You can look for me on YouTube if you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on Instagram. Look for my name, Chris Garcia, where we just spend time in the presence of God. There's no agenda. We're just spending time with the Lord Jesus. And um, I see there's almost a thousand of you watching on YouTube. Our YouTube channel has been exploding for the glory of God. We're at we're almost at 118,000 subscribers. We're at 117,000. And so be a part of the Fresh Oil family. Check us out um, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And it's a devotional style type of stream. And uh, I know it will be a big, big blessing for you. Also, yeah, Peaceful Journey says, I found you on YouTube. Praise God. Also, I uh, want to encourage you. Um, there's several events that we have coming up. You can visit our website, fathersglory.org forward slash events. I will be in Gonzalez, Louisiana, April 12th through the 14th. I will be in Dallas, Texas, May 18th. And then we have our second annual um, fresh oil outpouring event in Houston, Texas. So I encourage you to check it out. Let me give you a quick snippet of our Houston event that we're going to host. Here's a little bit of how it will look like based on last year. So I pray it's a blessing. friends 
it is now that time for me to get going. I don't know how often I'll do this type of stream via Facebook and YouTube, but every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, join our YouTube family, the Fresh Oil family. Amen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We're going to do a special communion type of live stream. We're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. We're going to talk about the blood of the lamb, and we're going to talk about Jesus as our faithful and true high priest. God bless you all. And I will see you Friday on Fresh Oil on our YouTube channel. Look for us, Chris Garcia. Blessings to you and see you tomorrow in Jesus' name.